after the tournament, you know, they invite you to Butler Cabin and you're sitting there. Like I said, I'm, I'm 21 and here's Gary Player. He's just shot 64 to win the Masters. Tom Watson, they won in the year before, has just finished second. He's sitting there. Rod Funseth tied for second. Great player. Hubert Green, it's going to go on and win majors. Tied for second. He's sitting there. And they're asking me questions in front of these guys for me to answer. This is On the Tee with h and I'm DJ Jones, and that was the voice of Lundy Miller, PGA from Shady Oaks Country Club. As you'll soon hear, the game of golf has taken Lindy on quite a journey throughout his career. During the course of this episode alone, we visited everywhere from the Lynx at Muirfield and the U.S. Open at Medina, to the Walker Cup at Shinnecock Hills, and yes, even Butler Cabin. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy our conversation with Lindy Miller. Well, Lindy, welcome to On the Tee with h and Thanks for investing some of your valuable time with us here today. I was reading a little earlier that back in the day, you had a cameo role in the movie Dead Solid Perfect. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking that uh, this experience is going to be a piece of cake compared to being on a movie set. Oh no! This this will be a lot lot better than that. But that was a uh, whole lot of fun. Dan Jenkins, who wrote that book, is from Fort Worth, and they filmed a lot of it at Colonial. But uh, when I was the golf pro at uh, Mira Vista, they filmed some out there. They were out there a couple of days filming, and I probably got in all of about maybe thirty seconds in the movie. So it was it was kind of a fun deal. Well, that is really great stuff. And uh, anyone that wants to see it, the full movie is actually up on YouTube. Uh, If you search DSP Golf Movie, someone's put the full version of it there. But this kind of reminds me of an old Seinfeld episode where he receives royalty checks for like six or seven cents (laughs) periodically. And I'm curious, are those checks still rolling in for you today? I think I got one check for $232, and then I got a check for nothing after that. <laughs> that was it. So over 30 years, it, it averages out to six to cents. To six cents. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you've been a great friend to h and for over a decade now, but I want to start even further back than that. You know, all of us in the game of golf have an origin story. You know, when we first picked up the club or came to find the game, and I would love to hear a little of yours. My, my dad and grandfather really were the ones that kind of got me started, but only because they played a little bit. My dad would play on, on Saturdays, and kind of that was the only day of the week. We weren't members of the club or anything, so we were doing the, the municipal golf courses here in Fort Worth. And I would tag along when, when I could on Saturdays. Back then, the golf courses wouldn't not even allow somebody younger than 12 years old to play golf, which really doesn't promote the game very well. But uh, so I would just go with him and his group and, you know, they would let me hit a few shots here and there that, that just kind of wet my appetite. I was, I was playing all the other sports at the time. I was playing football and baseball and, and basketball As I went along seventh, eighth grade, I quit playing the other sports, uh, football. I played through the eighth grade. One of the practices, it was the the tackling drill, and you just go, you know, against one other guy. And it was like, man, my head hurts on this deal. I I don't know that I want to just keep doing that. And And I was real small. I didn't grow till a little bit later. So I was getting beat up and I said, no, nah, this is probably not going to work. And so I just kind of, kind of made my way to golf knowing that, you know, size doesn't matter. Uh, you're in every play, no matter what. And it all came down to score. If you shoot the best score, you play. And uh, I kind of liked that. So I was just really focused on golf going forward from from then on probably the ninth grade that's when I really really started to see some improvement after my sophomore year I made the U.S. junior and it was at Brookhaven in Dallas and that was the first uh kind of national tournament that I'd ever played in 
I got through the stroke play, which, you know, was a, was a big deal uh, because I had not played that much. I uh, didn't know what to really expect in the match play and ended up beating one of the uh, members there at Brookhaven that was a real good player. I don't think I made very many members there happy, but uh, I beat him. And then uh, beat Curtis Strange the next next match. I mean, he was out driving me. I was still very small. I'd probably hit it 220, and he was hitting it 260, 270. And then I uh, ended up losing in the quarterfinals. But that, that one really catapulted me to some of the things that I was able to do in golf. Well, that catapult, as you called it, uh, sent you to Oklahoma State, where you played your collegiate golf. And you and your teammates uh, won a pair of NCAA championships, and you were an All-American. And you, you eventually played your way onto the 1977 Walker Cup team, an event that has you know, some strong ties to some of the greatest courses on both sides of the Atlantic, but also to the heritage of the game as a whole. What was your experience like as a member of the Walker Cup team at Shinnecock Hills? Well, it was fantastic. You know, it's just such an honor to represent your country and and to be able to do that. I've, you know, never served in the military, and, and it was just an honor to play for the United States. And obviously, it's very, very competitive. All of us on the U.S. team wanted to win. I mean, bad. You don't go out there and, and uh, tee it up for your country and lose. I mean, everybody was excited, and it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking. You, you think about who you're playing for, but, you know, you have a special bond with those team members, uh, just like NCAA and, and uh, at Oklahoma State. You know, those, those guys are best friends. We're best friends for life. You know, going back to, to Shinnecock, opening ceremony you're standing on top of that hill that that uh, great clubhouse there at Shinnecock you know it's hosted so many events now and you're standing up there and and uh, opening ceremony and they're raising the flag for your country and it just sends you know goosebumps still uh, I know on their team Sandy Lyle was on their team a guy named Peter McAvoy who was I think he had probably won the British Amateur a couple of times or something but I think he was the most acclaimed, you know, everybody wanted to play their best guy. And uh, fortunately I got to play him twice, uh, once an individual and once in foursomes and uh, was fortunate enough to win both, both matches, but we ended up winning 16 to eight, but uh, just a great experience the whole, the whole week, you know, it, it was, <laughs> it's, it's a lot more fun when you win, obviously, but just going through that, and uh, being a part of that for your country, there's, it's hard to explain, but uh, really a special event for that week. Well, goosebumps, for sure. I mean, just listening to you retell it, I mean, you painted such a clear picture, and I think all of us can imagine seeing the flag go up in front of the clubhouse at Shinnecock, and what an honor uh, that had to be. And sticking with the U.S. theme, if you will, um, as we're recording this, the U.S. Open is getting underway at Torrey Pines. You played in the tournament a half dozen times. What is it like standing on the first tee of the United <laughs> States Open? Well, it's intimidating the first time. You know, to get in that event, the U.S. Open, uh, when I was 18 at Medina, you know, I, I didn't really know what to do uh, other than what I'd been doing is just you know, playing and, you know, playing one shot at a time, but standing on the first tee, it's, it's nerve wracking. I might not remember anything from holes two to 18, but I can remember the first tee shot, or I might remember the last putt. And, uh, I hit it in the right rough off that first hole. And this is with old equipment. This is with, you know, real woods and, and, and balls that don't go very far as compared to today. But, uh, Hit it in the right rough, hit seven iron, just a little bit short left of the green flag. Whole placement was front left and uh, chipped it up there about six feet, made par. So that kind of helped, but it uh, it was just kind of a long day. I ended up shooting 80, 77, missing the cut. But what a great experience. And uh, that, that kind of got me going. I went straight from there to the NCAA championship in uh, Columbus, Ohio 
and finished fourth as, as a freshman, which was a good finish, and the team finished second. Playing in that event, being around uh, the tour players, playing in a USGA event like that with a lot of rough and a very, very golf course made a big difference uh, experience-wise for me. You know, the, the next uh, Open that I played in – was at Southern Hills. That was great too, because, you know, going to school there in Stillwater, 60 miles away from Tall, having a lot of people there and uh, being the low amateur, that was, that was a special, special week there too. But what a treat and to, to be part of that and, and to play in events like that. Uh, it's really special. Who do you think gets through the grind of this U.S. Open on top? Well, that's a hard one there. You know, I actually think if if John Rahm can get off to a good start, that he'll have a good chance. He's playing great. You know, there's a obviously a setback there. Sometimes it, this is a crazy game, and and you'll see, you know, a guy finish second at an event uh, one year, almost win, and then the next year he'll come back and win that same event, or you see somebody something happens, you know, uh, negative. And then the next week or two, they come back and maybe even win the golf tournament. And he was playing so good. He's played good for a year. If he can get off of, uh, with a good start, I think he's got a good chance. Well, before we jump ahead, I want to keep us on memory lane for just a little longer because I have to ask about the 1978 Masters. You finished tied for 16th, you were low amateur, and of course that means a trip to Butler Cabin for the post-tournament interview and the presentation of the green jacket. Was that experience as surreal as all of us imagine it might be? Oh, for sure. Uh, Really no other way to say it, but uh, absolutely. You know, going into the tournament, I was really focused and uh, on on playing and, and what I wanted to accomplish. And fortunately, I, I did uh, accomplish what I wanted to. But, uh, you know, starting off the week, you know, I stayed in the crow's nest because I was an amateur. There weren't a whole bunch of guys staying up there. Gary Hallberg stayed up there and probably a couple of the European or uh, Great Britain and Ireland guys. Uh, so four or five of us up there in that dorm dorm room like setting i do remember either there wasn't any air conditioning up there or or it was it was turned off or whatever because the windows were open when we were when we were asleep and it's right there off the first tee i mean it, it's right there and i didn't have a tee time until like 1 30 or something that first day you know 6 30 in the morning they're doing the opening ceremony on the first tee and everybody in the crow's nest wakes up. So now I've got seven hours of, you know, wasting time to try to get there. Plus I've already watched the opening ceremony in my pajamas up there from the crow's nest. And so that's making me more nervous, but uh, it's just such an experience. And, and same thing there. It's like, okay, I remember the, the first hole. I hit it left a little bit hit that same seven iron that I did at Medina, hit it a little left, got it up and in for par. And uh, I don't really remember a whole lot of other shots. I do remember holing out on uh, on 18. I had about a 10 or 12 foot downhiller for par that I made uh, that ended up where I tied for 16th. And that got me in the next year, even though I turned pro. You know, after after the tournament, you know, they invite you to Butler Cabin and you're sitting there like I said, I'm, I'm 21, and here's Gary Player. He's just shot 64 to win the Masters. Tom Watson, the one in the year before, has just finished second. He's sitting there. Rod Funseth tied for second. Great player. Hubert Green, it's going to go on and win majors, tied for second. He's sitting there, and they're asking me questions in front of these guys for me to answer. And – uh it's just it's just amazing that uh, I've I've had the opportunity to to be in that position, and I look at it, you know, God blessed me with a 
with a talent to play golf. And it's just given me an opportunity to do things like that. It's just, it's been fabulous. Well, as you may know, Augusta National has the final round for, I believe, all of the Masters tournaments available on YouTube. And so I pulled it up and watched, and I thought it was really neat that Arnold Palmer was the one doing the Q&A session there in Butler Cabin. We're so used to seeing uh, Jim Nance handling it today, and I just thought that was uh, pretty cool to see, you know, Goff's greatest showman, if you will, uh, running the show uh, there in Butler Cabin. Oh, for sure. You know, with, with Arnold Palmer asking the questions, you know, how great is that? Uh, and being there at Augusta National, you know, just what an honor it was to, to sit with him and, and have him ask us the questions along with, with all the other guys as well. He presented me the trophy outside at the outside ceremony after the butler cabin. And, and as things were winding down, they did uh, the ceremony out there as well. Funny thing, uh, probably, oh, two years ago, I, I got something in the mail and it was a picture of uh, he and I shaking hands at that ceremony, which I did not have. Uh, and somebody had sent me that to, uh, to sign for him. So I did that and sent it back and made sure with them that it would be okay to, to reprint that for my records. And, and uh, it was a real blessing. And, and to have that picture and just, you know, bring back those memories was fantastic. Well, and just showing how everything kind of comes full circle in the game of golf and touching on that friends for life thing that you mentioned earlier, your former Walker Cup teammate, Fred Ridley, is now the one handling that ceremony as chairman of Augusta National. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Fred, uh, actually, when I was at uh, Mira Vista uh, Country Club here in Fort Worth, we hosted the U.S. Girls Junior. And, and, and Fred, I think, may have been president of USGA at that time, but he flew in and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And, and it was just great to, to catch up. But uh, it, it does come full circle. It's, it's, it's an interesting game that we all love. Over the years, it just comes back to where we started from. It's, it's pretty neat stuff. Well, fast forwarding more to the present day, uh, you spent many years at Mira Vista Country Club in Fort Worth, and now you're at Shady Oaks, a club that is perhaps best known for its ties to the great Ben Hogan. With such a rich history already built in at Shady Oaks, I'm curious, what has travel brought to the club that might have otherwise been missing? You know, we, we've got uh, a great membership at Shady Oaks, and they do a lot of traveling. But something uh, like the golf trips that we do to Scotland, Ireland, England, I, I think it just brings more light to kind of the history of the game, but also with the history of Shady Oaks and, and Mr. Hogan. Just as an example, we've been to, you know, Carnoustie and Pan Muir, and the guys that, uh, that I take over there, you know, some of them are, were around Mr. Hogan, but all of them have been around Shady Oaks for a long time, and they know the history. It just brings that history out more, and it, it did it for me, too. I never went over there and played when I when I played the tour because I would have had to qualify. I might've missed two tournaments over here, things like that. So I never went. I look back on that and I think about Mr. Hogan in 1953, taking the boat over there and having to qualify and then winning the tournament and missing the PGA because he's got to take the boat back. Now that's some sacrifice for it. Boy, we're also happy that he did it too. And all the people over there at, Carnoustie and in Scotland are the same way. It was so special for me, you know, having grown up around him, having caddied for him, and kind of following his footsteps, not necessarily winning, not necessarily playing in the open over there at Carnoustie, but being at the same place, all that history was made. And, and I think all our guys have gotten a kick out of that. It's a really special place when you go to Carnoustie and you go to the Hogan Suite and you find a guy that's got two or three scrapbooks that he's laying on the table and showing all these members from Shady Oaks where Mr. Hogan 
you know, spent the rest of his life basically because he was there as a 10 year old kid following him. It just makes everything so special and so unique uh, to be able to do that. Well, you mentioned Carnoustie and Pan Muir. Of course, two places with strong ties to Mr. Hogan, uh, Carnoustie being where he won the Open in 53 and Pan Muir being where he essentially taught himself to play Lynx golf for a couple weeks right before the tournament. I'm curious, I, I know you've covered a lot of ground overseas, but any other favorite uh, memories from across the pond? I'll tell you, they're all great. I've taken these, uh, this same group of guys, uh, this will be the sixth year this year. We've had so many good times. It's, it's hard to put, you know, one out in front of the other, but I tell you the day at Muirfield where you play four ball in the morning, you go in, shower, put your coat and tie on, eat in the lunchroom, fabulous buffet. And then you go out and play foursomes in the afternoon. I don't know how it can get any better than that. The golf courses are great, you know, everywhere. You know, we've been England, uh, Scotland, and Ireland. But the day at Muirfield, because it's all day and uh, the formality at lunch and, and all of it just really adds to it in the foursomes in the afternoon. So that's a really special day when you can experience all of that in one day. You know, few things will test a friendship quite like uh, foursomes play at Muirfield. Yeah, yeah, but it's it, it, and it's different. It's it's hard because I'm I'm the one that's doing the pairing, so you know I may get blamed for some of that too. They may not just blame their partner; they may blame me. And and that foursomes goes so fast, and the way they've got those uh, walk paths, the guy that's not teeing off goes straight to the fairway, and you know you play in two and a half hours. But uh, it, it, it's fun. And, and some of the guys had never played foursomes. And, you know, it, it's different because you're standing over a shot that you're not going to hit the next one. And so wherever it goes is where your partner, you know, has to go hit it from. So it's, it's different for sure. Well, Lindy, as we start to draw this to a close, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you've been at this a long time. And if, if I was a young PGA professional getting started in my career, any particular advice that you'd pass along? You know, first, I, I think I would say learn everything you can each and every day. Learn everything about the business, you know, whether it be merchandising, teaching, uh, the operations, uh, management, and just continue to learn you know, learn every day. And, and that's, that's what keeps you going. That's what keeps it fun when you're learning. You know, the second thing <clears throat> I think is real, real important is become a better player. You don't have to be a tour player. You don't have to be, you know, some great, great player, but become a better player. Sometimes in the business, we get sidetracked because there's so many things going on that we don't play, but uh, try to wedge some time to practice and become a better player uh maybe another one is is to get to know people better you know take trips with them that's that's the greatest thing but as we get fast and furious each and every day if it's if it's uh busy at the club or the golf course it's hard to kind of get to know people take a little time to really get to know them get to know them get to know their families get to know all about them Maybe the last thing, just have fun every day. Just enjoy what, you, what you're doing. You're in a great, great profession. You're outside, you're inside, you're around people. Enjoy it and present a fun atmosphere for all your customers. It'll be fun for them. It'll be fun for you. It'll be very, very gratifying for you as well. Well, that is some invaluable insight, Lindy, to say the least. And I'm going to wrap us up here with one last easy question. Where to next? Well, actually, we're getting ready to go in uh, kind of the end of June, end of August. Uh, kind of start out at uh, Northwest Ireland, uh, Nairn and uh, Port New, uh, Donegal, County Sligo, Carn, Ennis Grown, kind of work that uh, our way down to uh, Bally Bunyan and Adair Manor. So it should be a good trip. It's 
it's amazing. And I don't have the number. You, you probably got the number of courses we played, but uh, with these guys, I've made, this will be the sixth trip. We've probably played, I don't know, 35 different courses, something like that. And, and a lot of them on the British uh, open rotation. And it's just been fabulous. We've never found one that we don't like, and it's just a fun place to be. Well, Lindy, thank you once again for investing uh, your valuable time with us here today. I certainly enjoyed every minute of it, and you can rest assured that all of us at h and are counting down the days to that expedition to Ireland right alongside you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>